uh, culture and uh, in how we interact with the world. Um, we started um, Future Focus uh, right in the middle of the pandemic last year, and the the, the purpose of these sessions was to um, basically to explore the role of art uh, in, uh, in, in society, but also in speci specifically uh, in times of crisis. And um, we had some really interesting people joining us from across the world, uh, despite uh, being uh, isolated. Uh, the current um, the current season, uh, Money and Environment, is co-curated with uh, Ismail Erturk, who is a senior um, lecturer at the Business School of the University of Manchester. And uh, Ismail is going to tell us more about the session today. But um, I just wanted to say maybe a few words that uh, the, the reason for, for this program was to bring to get together people from the arts, uh, academia, um, finance and other sectors uh, in having creative exchanges and conversations around topics uh, that explore how uh, money and the environment might be related throughout uh, history. So this is the second session. In the first one, um, we explored um, uh, we explored like the impact of uh, money production uh, on the environment, and uh, we I should say that we recognize that these sessions and these topics are very are quite complex, and obviously we can't go into uh, depth in just an hour that we have for the conversations. But uh, actually, this is what we're trying to do with uh, the Money and Environment series to dedicate uh, more than one, like a whole season of events and hopefully more than just the conversation. So, um, so if you uh, keep following, then we will uh, hopefully have more news about that. So uh, today we are thrilled to be um, joined by an amazing uh, panel. Uh, uh, Professor Bobby Banerjee from the Business School at City University of London, um, Marlos uh, Nichols, Head of Programs at the Finance Innovation Lab, uh, Sam uh, Lavin, uh, Artist, Educator and Assistant Professor at the Department of Design at uh, University of Texas in Austin, and uh, last but not least, Hannah Stewart from Dark Matter Labs. And um, I'm just going to pass uh, next to um, Ismail, who is the co-curator of these sessions, to tell us more about today's discussion. And then uh, we'll start with our guests by um, having uh, brief introductions and we'll go into a uh, conversation. As you can see on the screen, um, we have, you can use the chat here if you want to say hello or if you want to uh, post any comments. And also uh, we uh, welcome uh, questions from everyone who is here throughout the session. So please use the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screen to post us uh, questions, which we're going to uh, answer and uh, throughout the session. So thank you very much, welcome. Uh, and uh, also if you, if you follow the conversations uh, on, on, on Twitter, you can, I have, uh, we have posted the, the hashtags there and uh, we will be posting the uh, bios and info for the speakers and links in the chat. Uh, thank you, Ismail. Do you want to say a few words about today's session? Right. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Uh, welcome everyone uh, and welcome our speakers as well. Uh, as uh, Irini uh, mentioned, uh, this is the second in a series uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, seminars where we would like to explore in a multidisciplinary way uh, the relations between money and environment. Uh, I mean, one of the concerns uh, I shared with Irini and, and uh, with, with colleagues uh, as well, uh, recently uh, 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 finance uh, fund managers, uh, <clears throat> banks, uh, and then regulators of finance, uh, central banks, have become very proactive about uh, uh, environmental uh, issues. Uh, uh, so uh, that, that creates a concern, uh, at least for me, and then for, for, for many of us, because uh, uh, finance has always been associated with bubbles. Uh, uh, they tend to create, and recently, more and then bigger bubbles in financial markets. And when they burst, uh, uh, 
they, they create a huge uh, socioeconomic costs. And we know that from 2007 and 2008 crisis, and recently Bitcoin is considered to be uh, another one. So the more I read about the, the current insider's uh, view of, of green finance, green bonds, uh, uh, they talk about uh, bubbles as well. Uh, like recently, the CEO of uh, Total, the French uh, energy company, uh, he said uh, publicly that uh, there is a, a renewables bubble uh, because uh, the money BP paid uh, to, to buy the wind uh, 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 energy sources in, in Scotland was, was too much. Uh, uh, and then uh, we also hear in the EU, uh, EU has done a taxonomy of, of green uh, uh, and then they decided not to go ahead with that because uh, if they applied that taxonomy of green, uh, there would be a bubble in, in financial markets because there's only 1% or 2% of companies in the stock market are, are classified as green according to that taxonomy. So everybody would invest in them and it would create a bubble. So that's concerning. And that leads me to think about another bubble, which I think is more important than today's uh, sessions topic, there is a bubble in which the finance community lives in when it comes to knowledge, ethics, and values. Uh, I mean, just a couple of days ago, when the Biden administration came to power, uh, they, they recalculated the uh, social cost of uh, greenhouse uh, uh, gases. Uh, uh, so compare the Trump administration, uh, per metric ton of social cost has increased from uh, a uh, uh, $7 to $51. Uh, so it is just overnight. Uh, 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 and then they use a different discount rate. And they also included global damages, not just national damages. Now, these are uh, uh, scary things that, that, that define, I mean, it's a good move, but who decides those discount rates? What kind of values drive uh, valuations, uh, drive these, these calculations are, are really another kind of bubble that the finance lives in. And uh, today's speakers will give us uh, insights, alternatives uh, to approach those, uh, those things. <clears throat> Over to you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Ismail. So, uh, Bobby, um, um, your, your, the stage is yours, so you're welcome to share your screen. Yeah, I'll do that in a bit. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Irini and Ishmael, for inviting me. And greetings from a cold, wet, miserable London. So here's my five-minute provocation. Despite all the incredible achievements in science and technology, the impressive advances in understanding the human condition in the social sciences, we, as in we in the West, still have no clue about how to value nature. And when we do try to monetize it, like putting a price on carbon emissions, for example, we make the situation even worse. And our valuation of nature, of putting a price on natural resources, is based on one particular worldview, one particular system of knowledge that has been universalized and made dominant through histories of colonialism. And it has subjugated other knowledges, suppressed other ways of knowing. So this process of knowledge creation and domination is not value free. It is a violent process, not just epistemic violence, but also material and structural violence, violence which leads to conflicts or natural resource extraction. So the last 10, 15 years, my research has focused on conflicts in the extractive industries. I'm going to share my slide, I hope that works. Can people see this? Yes, excellent. Now I focus on violent conflicts involving, involving both state and market violence, not because I like violence, but because state violence represents a failure of hegemony. When a democratic state is actively killing its own citizens with impunity to extract value from nature, when communities are prepared to put their bodies on the line to preserve a particular way of life, I think there are some lessons to be learned. So these conflicts are generally described as conflicts over land and resource rights, but there are deeper, more profound tensions between different meanings and different valuations of nature. So here's a list of ongoing violent conflicts. Uh, there are a lot more, but these are the names I could fit into one slide. 
Uh, if you take a look, what strikes you is it is no coincidence that all the countries involved in these violent conflicts are former colonies. It is also no coincidence that the companies and banks that are financing these uh, uh, mining projects are headquartered in London, Paris, New York, Montreal, Madrid, right? The second thing which strikes you when you look at this is that apart from China, Vietnam, and I think Laos is a constitutional monarchy, the rest of these countries are all democracies. So which begs the question, in what way is democracy serving the communities who are being dispossessed and killed, right? So direct colonialism in these countries may have ended, the white man may have gone, but colonial modes of extraction still continue to operate with native elites, I guess, like me, now doing most of the colonial administration. So here's a case which I've written about. This is just a visual of where the minerals are being extracted from. We know where they're going. Right? So this is a case I wrote about, which describes a resistance movement by an indigenous community in India, Eastern India, over the construction of a, a bauxite man, a mine, aluminum oxide mine, by the Vedanta group in the Niamgiri mountain range. But 8,000 Dongria Khan tribals live in these mountains. That mountain is not just a source of livelihood. It, is a, it carries deep cultural and religious significance. They worship the mountain as a god. The mountain is also a rich source of bauxite. And this is the hill which I showed you was supposed to be a proposed site for a mine. There's a lot of opposition uh, from, from uh, the, the community as well as a lot of groups which got together because not only will it have ecological consequences, it would also affect local communities, livelihoods and culture. So the height of the conflict, I came across two statements. The first was uh, the chairman of Vedanta, who says that we believe uh, our strategy and business will harness India's high quality wealth at low cost of development, positioning it as a leader on the global metals and mining map. Now, it's absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with that statement. India, despite what you see on television, is still a very poor country. And for poor countries, digging things out of the ground and selling them is a huge source of revenue. Get jobs, taxes, uh, you know, foreign exchange. There's nothing wrong with the statement. Nobody's going to disagree with this. The problem is in that same mountain, we have a, a, a tribal leader who says, no, we can't do this. Nyamgir is the name of the mountain. If you lose the mountain, we end up in great trouble. We will lose our soul and our soul will die. Now, I don't know about you guys, but your basic high school economics will tell you mountain is the mountain is a soul is not a very efficient use of the mountain. There's $2.6 billion worth of bauxite inside that mountain. Okay, I can see banks and finances financing that. What is the net present value or discounted cash value of a soul? Which bank is going to uh, finance the mountain as a soul, right? How do you harness the soul of the mountain and the tribes to generate this high quality wealth? So you see what the problem is. Because contrary to the premise of the global economic paradigm, it is impossible, impossible to have one universal metric for comparing and exchanging the real values of nature amongst different groups of people, different cultures, and with very different degrees of political and economic power. The problem is they're both right. So Mr. Agarwal will not dispute the tribal's connection. They've been there for 40,000 years, and he has no problem that the tribes worship the mountain. The problem is they're both right, right? What happens when you've got two rights? When you have two rights, as a wise man told us a couple of hundred years ago, force decides. And that's exactly what happened where the government sent in the police and the army to quell the protests. So this is a basic problem, right? Because Western science is based on a dualism between humans and nature. So we've transformed nature into something called the environment, which we can manage and control, right? If there is any hope in addressing the ecological crisis, any hope in addressing the climate emergency, this dualism has to be destroyed. We need to have a profoundly different relationship with the natural world. So this epistemic violence I talked about can only be overcome by rejecting this hierarchical ontology and embracing a relational ontology, right? Which involves embracing other knowledges. Otherwise, we run the risk of being the only species in the planet intelligent enough to foresee our own imminent demise, but too stupid to do anything about it. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Bobby. That was yeah, that was brilliant. Um, uh, just a reminder to uh, all our attendees: please um, keep sending uh, your questions via the Q and A or or any comments in the chat. 
uh, and we will address them throughout the uh, when we move to the conversation next. Um, Marlos, uh, would you like to to go next, please? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's fantastic to um, be part of this conversation this evening. My mind's already like fizzing with ideas, but I'm going to try and stick um, to my the provocation I prepared. So just share my screen. Okay, great. So as um, Arini said, I work for uh, the Finance Innovation Lab, which is a UK based charity. And we believe that finance must and can play a positive role in our lives, but it's not straightforward to achieve the change that will get us there. And um, I, I thought that I'd share some ideas around green finance and explore some of the potential pitfalls of mainstream conceptions um, of green finance. And I think it really picks up on some of the issues that Ishmael and Bobby have just shared as well. So um, I think as Ishmael said, if we consider how green finance is used today and who buy it, it can, you could come to the conclusion that we're kind of winning, that the financial system is greening. Um, but I'd suggest that there are kind of three main ways that green finance gets construed and three main ways it kind of, uh, what, I'll, I'll show you what it means in practice, which I think really risk actually working against any transition to a just green uh, future. So I think the first um, common conception is that green finance is about bringing together bits of finance, harnessing finance to fund um, green initiatives. And uh, an example might be that the big banks are now offering green mortgages that uh, provide incentives for people to uh, make their homes more energy efficient. But the problem with this conception of green finance is that it misses the elephant in the room, which is the rest of the financial system, which is contributing to the climate crisis and environmental damage. Um, so if you take that example of green mortgages again, yes, banks are offering those, but what else are they financing? And we know that they are financing very harmful fossil fuels such as tar sands and coal. And a report last year found that 35 banks have uh, provided $2.7 trillion worth of finance to fossil fuels since 2016, and that that number is rising. And this image was taken from a recent report commissioned by the government on uh, the economics of biodiversity, which acknowledges that this is a problem. Um, the second common conception of green finance, I think, is that green finance is about protecting the financial system from dangerous nature. And here's a picture of the city of London underwater at threat that Ishmael actually pointed me to. <laughs> Um, and uh, this is really the main way I think financial policymakers and regulators think about green finance and they ask the industry to do this too. So you might have heard of the task force for climate finance, uh, climate risk disclosures, and they ask firms to share information um, about the risks that their businesses are faced uh, from climate um, and this is really quite perverse because it ignores the fact that the financial system actually created uh, the environmental crises in the first place. Um, and also, I think it's, it's drawing on something called the efficient market hypothesis, which assumes that we can you know, use information to uh, adequately price risks and then allocate capital in an optimal way. And that hypothesis is controversial at the best of times, but you know, is it even possible to put a price on nature? Can we try and model any kind of climate risks when ecosystems are so complex and non-linear? And uh, you know, I think this also really connects to some of the issues that Bobby just mentioned as well. Like, what does it even mean to put numbers on nature? Um, so then there's the third way. And um, I think the third way of understanding green finance is that it's about profits. It's an opportunity to make money. And the chancellor in the UK had a budget announcement today and he really celebrated green finance in this way too. 
He sees it as a way to achieve economic growth and uh, boost UK competitiveness on the world stage. So this conception you know, raises a really important and thorny question around does growth, is that uh, compatible with um, it's building a sustainable future? And it also um, uh, makes us question, I think, you know, do the profitable products that we're going to create in green finance, do they actually have a good, any kind of good impact? And I think ESG is a very interesting case study to look, like, look at. So this is a, an increasingly popular set of investment strategies where assets are allocated um, depending on various environmental, social and governance factors such as carbon footprints or corporate governance. And unfortunately, for a number of reasons, if you look at ESG funds, it's very unclear that they have any kind of positive green impact. So the uh, brilliant think tank Commonwealth did a report uh, at the end of last year, and it showed um, that of a set of popular climate funds, one third of them included oil and gas companies. And the most common alternative companies that were in those funds were big tech and finance. So are they really part of the positive future that we want to build? So what, how could we rethink what green finance might mean? Um, and that's you know, what we're trying to do at the lab. So we're trying to start from the point of this question, which is how can we build a financial system that serves people and planet? And we're trying to reorient firms, innovation, and policy making around how um, they can really care for humans and the planet. And as I mentioned at the start, that's not easy. It requires a fundamental shift in the way that we think about money and finance and what their purpose are and a change in power dynamics and who has power over the system. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Marlos. That's uh, great. Um, I can see that uh, there are already a few comments uh, in the chat by uh, Phil Rosner, etc. So, so, yeah, please keep sending them in, keep sending questions as well, and uh, we'll, we'll go into this uh, in very shortly. Um, so next, we, we have Sam Lavin. Sam, over to you. Hi, uh, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. My name is Sam Levine. I'm an artist uh, who works mostly works with technology, and I'm calling in today uh, from Brooklyn, New York. So I'm just going to quickly show you um, a project that I made a few years ago called White Collar Crime Risk Zones, um, and it is a predictive policing application that targets white collar crime. So first, what is predictive policing? Uh, pr predictive policing systems uh, make predictions about where and when crime will occur based on historical data about where and when crimes have already occurred. Uh, this is uh, an example from an actual product called Hunch Lab. Uh, the software here is predicting that there is a high likelihood of larceny uh, for that green highlighted square. So these are systems that are, you know, these are real systems. They're deployed all across the US, uh, possibly across the world, I'm actually not sure. Um, and they're machine learning systems, right? So, you know, and they have all of the typical problems that machine learning systems have. Uh, so they're only as good as the data that you give them. And by necessity, they reinforce and reproduce the biases in that data. So these predictive policing systems are particularly dangerous because the consequences are so dire potentially, and because they rely on data that's generated by uh, systemically racist police departments. They create a kind of feedback loop of over policing certain communities, uh, and they do so with a veil of scientific objectivity. Uh, so, in response to this, uh, we, uh, my uh, collaborators and I, who are Brian Clifton and uh, Francis Singh, we decided to um, make our own predictive policing app that uses the same techniques and methodologies of these real predictive policing apps. But instead of um, uh, using data about street crime, we put in data from FINRA, which is the financial industry regulatory, uh, regulatory uh, authority here in the United States. Um, 
to get our data, we parsed thousands of PDFs uh, published by FINRA, looking for instances where they had fined organizations for a variety of violations. We then produced a machine learning model capable of predicting the likelihood of white collar crime within an accuracy of 90%, which is well above uh, industry standards, I should mention. Uh, we also wrote a white paper about our, our, our methodology. Uh, and in doing this, I should, just, I should just note, we did our utmost um, to really follow to the best of our abilities, uh, the rigor, uh, that uh, a real predictive policing system would use. So this is what we, we made. Uh, this is New York City. The rectangles indicate locations where we predict a high likelihood of white collar crime. The redder and darker the square, the higher the danger level. Uh, and clicking on different squares gives you um, uh, additional information. Right. So it's going to show what kinds of crimes are most likely to occur, uh, the severity of the crimes, uh, and you know nearby financial firms that act as institutional suspects. We also have on certain squares that are very dark red, um, a composite image of the most likely individual white collar criminal suspect. This is a facial average of high level financial executives who work in the area that I scraped from LinkedIn. So, you know, as you can see, it's kind of like every, every uh, composite is uh, unique, uh, but they all kind of like look the same, right? Um, so the map covers the you know, entire United States. Uh, and we also um, have an iPhone app that will send you a push notification when you enter a high risk zone for white collar crime. And I'll just say in, in conclusion of this very brief uh, presentation that um, with this project with white collar crime risk zones, we're hoping to achieve for wealth what typical policing has achieved for poverty, which is to say, we hope to criminalize it. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. That's a, a brilliant uh, project. I, I, rem I, I remember like seeing coming across it, and it was it, it was mind blowing actually. Um, so uh, last but not least, we have uh, Hannah Stewart from um, Dark Matter Labs, and over to you, Hannah. Cool. Thank you. I trust you can see my screen. I want to say a few things. I think there's an awful lot going on here. And I think it's quite telling that the only way I could kind of think to frame this provocation was a 2017 meme about galaxy brain. But I kind of want to invert it because I want to kind of start at the, some of those fundamental shifts that Bobby pointed at in terms of the way we calibrate value is wrong. The type of things that we're rooting our currency valuations in are not tied to either a finite planet or to care or any of the other different relationships we have. Um, I want to be able to spin this in a way that goes from that though into kind of how we actually make a difference and how we do have a hopeful way forward. Um, so starting at the galaxy brain side of things, our relationship to value is fundamentally broken. Um, money is a poor measurement of consequence, um, either as a standing reserve as a baseline currency, as a kind of metric that we are evaluating anything on, um, because its valuation is based on relationships in the same way as Bobby was highlighting earlier. This is irreconcilable in so many ways with the state of where we are now. And it's been built on a set of assumptions around property rights, around land, around how we relate to each other and around what we valorize. And I would point on an individual level back to the physio, and that kind of almost hopeful moment that was about looking at the economy differently, valuing the economy and people and land as one body, one entity. And in some ways, I'd also like to point at the thing that kind of didn't let that land in a way that would have seeded a fundamentally different system was our perception of bodies was rooted in a colonial identity, was rooted in a 
very Western perspective and seeded this kind of idea of the body as something removed from relationships that could be diagnosed and operated on rather than actually anything um, more in connect, interconnected, more entangled than that. Um, in terms of our work at Dark Matter Labs, I think one of the things to be really straightforward about is this is a made world. We made it this way, we can unmake it. We can change the things that are the factors that change the world. And one of the premises we would say is that those are the dark matter entities that shape behaviors like contract structures, like valuation, like what our responsibility is to nature through land stewardship arrangements or similar. Um, that mismatch between values and risk and consequence is utterly incompatible with how we are now operating. We're in an age of long emergencies, mid a pandemic. I've not been to London for like over a year now. Like, I don't think I've left my house more than five times. We've got all of these different decisions that as institutions, as cities, as democracies, and as individuals and families that we're trying to make in order to responsibly navigate the next little while. Um, those are different sorts of accountabilities different sorts of institutions and different sorts of ways of convening those conversations so that we can operate successfully in an age of long emergencies. And that process of transition though, and I think we've heard it kind of in some of the framings of these other few provocations, transition is about recalibrating relationships. That means that impacts people's identities, people's experiences, people's assumptions, and also takes a degree of honesty about what those relationships currently are, what they are built on, what those values are. Um, obviously there's that recalibrating of our relationship with nature, but there's also that kind of recalibration of our relationship with time and with how we think about investing in the future differently. Um, in terms of Dark Matter Lab's current work, I'd particularly point at Trees' infrastructure and some of our emergent thinking around climate city contracting for human thriving. And I'd also point particularly at, in that work, the decision not to make that a legislative thing, that to be a very much a pledge, a set of behaviours that we kind of move into, that we agree to, that is a consensual thing. Because um, I think that's actually a fundamental distinction in how we think about democracy and how we think about making decisions collectively. That whole collective thing, if we're going to be recalibrating ecosystems, stood in this kind of narrow now, looking back on these long overhanging histories and also kind of our aspirations for the future, we're going to need to have ways of collectively learning and relearning. Um, there's the idea of rethinking the notions of value itself in terms of reforming the financial system. Um, but there's also that kind of care work of transitioning whole value chains. Um, that learning, that relearning, those are different sorts of methods. Those are different sorts of mechanisms. We need processes and a kind of learning backbone for how we think about that and how we're accountable to it. All of this kind of seeing and shifting ecosystems requires new types of innovation, new types of infrastructures, and new types of ways of imagining together. That's kind, I don't think we can view the arts as an instrumental thing that should be in service of our rethinking. I think collective imaginaries, collective imagining, being able to recalibrate um, what we am, who is allowed to imagine, what sort of futures they're allowed to influence is actually quite a big process of reinvesting in the muscle of people to be imagined at a collective level, at a community level, and also to regain familiarity about the things that have been taken away from the collective and put into kind of financial norms. Um, I'd kind of want to end on all of these infrastructures for imagination, all of the kind of new structures for convening, opportunities for innovation, for managing this risk differently, they don't all have to be from the lens of financialization. They don't, we're not gonna be able to put a dollar sign on carbon and shift the extractive industries. 
these new types of capacity can though be built from where we are now and we have to move away from this idea of whoever's caused the most harm shouldering the most blame before we do any sort of action i think we need to be recognizing the players in play now and using everything we can to be able to rethink all of these mismatches from the kind of ontological alienation away from nature and the environment and this very western perspective all the way through to how do we invest in being able to think differently being able to allow other people allow a good range of people to imagine the future i will stop sharing my screen Thank you so much, Hannah. That was uh, a great way to close the provocations. And um, I, I would like to um, pass on to Ismail so he can kickstart our conversation. And uh, please, um, uh, our audience, please feel free to post any uh, questions in the uh, Q&A or in the chat uh, so we can bring this into the discussion. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you all for your amazing um, sharings. Right. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> join uh, Irene to, to thank you all. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's really <clears throat> uh, 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 insightful uh, uh, and then new, new, new languages, uh, new, new ways. Uh, uh, I have a couple of questions uh, that are coming up. Uh, 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 but before, before we... <clears throat> Uh, uh, look at the questions and pass them on uh, uh, to you uh, uh, based on the publications that you've uh, uh, created. Uh, I mean, we have uh, concepts uh, about, about how we can uh, think differently, uh, but also we have practices like, like Sam and Malus uh, have, have uh, 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 identified. I guess uh, my, my question to you all would be how do we then link uh, 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 alternative or different ideas, values uh, into, into uh, uh, influencing, not necessarily immediately, uh, uh, but, but, but uh, uh, in, in some way, uh, have, uh, 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 I mean, the society, finance and an academia uh, 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 sort of uh, turn them into a, a, a debate discourse but also uh, uh, actionable things so uh, uh, what are your views uh, I'm going to hop in if no one else is just yet. Um, I feel like a lot of being able to have a shared understanding is both being able to see lots of different aspects of the same system and see the felt impacts of that, but being also to um, aware of what agency people do or do not have within the positioning that they have within these complex made systems. Um, I would say that accountability is the key and that as we are <laughs> developing new processes we need to be thinking through how are the ways that the green finance initiatives or similar um, structuring accountability to the past in terms of reparations in terms of being able to account for the overhangs being able to bring in the voices that have been marginalized so far. Um, accountability to the present, both in terms of how we operate, who's gonna benefit. Um, is there a, a way of doing the current process that can be more rooted in empathy, care, listening, hearing the voices. Um, and then also that accountability to the future not just in a kind of abstract seven generations sense, but also in recognizing that colonizing the future is a genuine risk and is something we're presently suffering from because of how the past was colonized too. And when we're creating these systems, if we are gonna have debt-based finance, if 
for revaluing nature-based assets, we need to be very aware that we are indebting the future in service of, I suppose, securing one, but it's definitely a live conversation. Yeah, I, I'm afraid I have a very dystopian, I have a very dystopian view of the future. Uh, I think our species probably deserves to get extinct in, in a way. Uh, I, think, I think the future is going to be what one of my respondents who was the CEO of one of the largest electricity companies in Europe, when we talked about climate change, he said, uh, this is the Mad Max world, we are going to inherit. There's going to be a breakdown in the national grid. Uh, we're going to have militia groups uh, in different places, a breakdown of national sovereignty. So yeah, I have a very dystopian view of what's going to happen. You will have pockets of sustainability, you know, living in, in, in that world, but you're not going to have this, this, this major system. The other, other future I can think of is the Blade Runner future. The, the original Blade Runner, not the not the remake. That that was a crappy film. The first one with Harrison Ford. Like that that is the kind of fear you see. A surveillance militarized. Some part is allowed to happen. Some resistance is allowed to happen as long as they don't threaten the military industry complex. Uh, but that's the kind of future I see. All right. Thank you, Bobby. And I know we have. Shall I offer a bit uh, of a, 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 a positive? Over to you. <laughs> let's, let's end with the positives. <laughs> I mean, this is all making me very thoughtful, but um, I think, yeah, at the lab, something that we're trying to pursue is creating more democracy within finance in a way that means that more people, well, everyone can have a say over the rules that shape the game, the regulation, but also the institutions within it. So we could set up, you know, in, in the UK, we are dominated by four shareholder owned banks, and that's very unusual. What if we had cooperative banks? What if we had mutual community forms of money um, that were not connected to, to, you know, the desire or the need to keep growing? And so we think that there are... Um, things like that to pursue. Um, but I think it probably needs to be coupled with also just reconnecting people with nature. Um, I think we are, you know, very disconnected um, at the moment. And then I think another thing that is really important is pushing, we need to fight as well. And I think pushing back against the privatization of finance, which is aided by the state um, is really urgent to do as well. Thank you all for, uh, I don't know if um, Sam, um, did you have to say, yeah, did you I have mean, anything I just, to say? I guess what I would just, I, this is only tangentially related, but I mean, I think it's, you know, it's not a co it's not really a coincidence that the two richest people on the planet are both trying to leave the planet. <laughs> well said. <laughs> you know, I mean, they would rather do that. That's like, you know, it's, it's so it's like the response is like, you know, <laughs> let's do instead of doing what would actually be the easier thing in a lot of ways, let's do the absolute hardest thing to avoid making any change at all. Right. And so I think that it's difficult to imagine how things could happen differently. Right. When 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 that's what appears to be the prevailing attitude. And I think that 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 is what and I wish they would just I mean, it'd be great if they left. Yes. You know, but. <laughs> Um. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, I mean, I know that like a few uh, people here on the panel um, have like an academic background and, uh, and they are part of the education kind of system as well. We, I think we were talking before about like uh, in one of uh, our kind of chats, like before this about education and something that I've been thinking about is like um, you know is that is it something do, is there is there like any kind of bright kind of uh, uh, place there in terms of is education changing to reflect on what on the challenges on what we're learning in terms of like uh, finance in terms of like you know power and because uh, you know and and knowledge and is that I, I don't know I mean hopefully there will be, I'm just thinking about like, you know, how are the, the new, the next generations are thinking about that? Like, how can we, yeah, 
it'd be great to to hear your thoughts because I know like yeah Bobby Ismail and uh, Sam and I know Hannah you you were all teaching as well I, yeah. yeah I'm happy go I guess that's what keeps me out from I don't have the money to leave the planet but that's what I guess what makes me get up and go to work in the morning is the only difference I am making is I guess in teaching you know I'm a teacher on this so I'm in a business school, so you can imagine this is not very easy to do. My American friends are constantly amazed why I haven't been fired yet. Uh, I teach a module on climate change and I make it very, very clear. I actually call the module climate injustice. I see my role in a business school as a professor of management, not to educate the next generation of CEOs. There are lots of business schools to do that. I see my role as educating the next generation of environmental activists, the next generation of political leaders, right? future prime ministers, perhaps policymakers. That's my role. And I make that very clear from the beginning. I don't want to educate the next generation of people who are going to cause the next financial crisis, which is what most business schools do, right? So for me, when I, if I, if I do get across this and when somebody says, yeah, you know, I guess that was pro probably the best, I would say, outcome in, in my entire career. Two or three people out of 100 would say, you know, I got this terrific job as a management trainee at Shell but I decided to intern with Greenpeace instead. If that happens, then my job is done. Does anyone else want to share anything in, in that context? I'm gonna go for the opposite side. I teach in terms of design products and futures at BRCA. Um, and on the positive side, I would say that design ways of knowing and doing can integrate non-Western thought. And if we start to view made systems through those lens and those designerly navigating uncertainty kind of skill sets, those would be good things to embed into both financialization, but also how we contract and how we organize. On the other hand, <laughs> um, any sufficiently intelligent young graduate coming into product design who is aware of the impacts, aware of the implications of making things and doing them in the world, risks leaving, you have an inverse Darwinism effect mm. because anyone who's sufficiently aware of the consequence of things and able to navigate and integrate deep thinking and various ways of knowing into that process will probably be conscious of their own impact in the world and do something else. So we risk having an inverse Darwinism effect where we end up with the people who are least aware of, and of course I'm not meaning my students, um, least aware of their consequence in the world and how to mitigate it are the ones making the things and proliferating the growth and the more chairs and the more everything's. Yeah, I'll just add a couple of things. Uh, uh, I think, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite important to, to, to uh, register that the uh, uh, younger generations, uh, the criticism uh, has, has a label called school strike. <laughs> I think that, that that's a serious message to educational establishment uh, that, that, you know, in, in many ways, we're not doing our jobs properly. Either we tell them one thing but then uh, 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 do, do, do something else. Uh, uh, but I think, I mean, uh, uh, I'm a bit more optimistic than, than uh, Bobby, because <laughs> I think the intergenerational thing, I mean, I increasingly see with my students, uh, the, the younger generations definitely have a different sensitivity and that different sensitivity requires different types of knowledges and then and engaging with, with value. So, uh, I mean, I've been teaching critical sort of finance uh, uh, long before it's become uh, uh, fashionable. Uh, 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 so, in a business school environment as well. Uh, uh, so, but that, that it's very important how we really uh, use the educational establishment, uh, which is a huge social cost <laughs> to the society. And, 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 and we know that, you know, some, some educational establishments uh, uh, are, not, are not doing their job properly in, in many ways, or they haven't learned from uh, what Hannah mentioned, like uh, uh, 
and and, and Marlos uh, uh, mentioned uh, uh, efficient <laughs> Marcus uh, Theo, which is which is a uh, you know uh, unbelievable how 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 still uh, some people and then as Marlos said, still I mean this ESG, which is the, the new way of doing good, <laughs> uh, is is has lots of pitfalls. I mean there, there's a belief that that that. Uh, only those companies who score high on ESG can deliver financial return. So they still think, you know, there's a correlation between <laughs> financial return and, and doing good, which needs to be uh, broken. Uh, uh, but I think, I mean, the, the, there's an intergenerational element, I think, which, which uh, 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 makes me more hopeful who are, their sensitivities demand different discourse uh, uh, but, but yeah, I agree, Rene. We, we need to play a, a bigger role uh, on that. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, unless uh, Sam has anything to add, I'm just going to bring uh, like a question that we have from Alexia Yates because I'm aware of time. And Alexia is asking about, uh, she's asking where does green finance and gender equity intersect? So she's um, uh, asking about like the uh, relationship uh, to nature in a way that accounts for the gendered uh, implications and, and, the, and the ways that uh, yeah, account for the gender implications. So I, I don't know if uh, anyone wants to, to answer that. I'm gonna put it in the um, answer line. I know Hannah, you're typing your answer, but would it be okay if you answer live so uh, yeah. everybody can hear? Yeah, I mean, I think that both the assumptions of a narrow range of genders or a narrow range of identities and a narrow range of who is allowed to have power, whose voice is respected, who actually shapes the made systems that we all live by, are all from the same root. It's that same colonial early root of us as distinct from nature, of a narrow range of people as being able to shape things. And I'd say that they're all rooted in such a hegemonic discourse that the only way you can do green finance in future is in a way that is against that. The only way you can do it is in a way that is intersectional and aware of where we are now and the necessary changes. I think in terms of the actual labor of that though, that's a whole different set of skills. That's a whole different set of awarenesses and scaffolding and support that we all need to learn, not just as a kind of select few who get to work in this in intersectionally aware organizations. We also need to be able to kind of have those conversations built into our standards and in how kind of all of the initiatives play. Thank you, yeah. I, I don't know if anybody else wants to add to these or contribute. No? So, uh, we've got we've got only a few minutes left, and um, I don't think we have any uh, more questions uh, from from our audience. But uh, I, it'd be great to have any final thoughts from all our panelists, and then uh, we're going to close the session. So, Bobby, do you want to let's, go let's first? Start in, let's start in reverse order. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we'll go back to Hannah. <laughs> I kind of half want to make Sam say something more around this. So essentially, I kind of see, I came from cultural sector and a variety of other different ways of working. Um, and I see massive parallels in terms of the instrumentation of culture and the instrumentation of nature. And the things that we expect people to work on and work for and be in service of. And I'd really... So in terms of like the way art works is allegory, it's myth, it's parallels and it's working on a kind of deep and playful layer. And I see massive um, opportunities for hacking systems, moving fast, moving playfully, all of those things as opportunities for change, not just this kind of slow, deliberative, patient thing. It's an emergency. Like we won't be here in 2035 if we carry on like this. Like Bobby says, like there is the dystopian possibility. So I kind of, I would love you, Sam, to say more around like 
not what can art do in service of the climate emergency or similar, but like how else should we be working? Yeah, it's a really good, it's a good question. And I don't have, I mean, I don't really have a single, a single, uh, a single answer, but I mean, I mean, you know, the, the typical response is always just like, uh, well, it expand, you know, you, we use art to sort of expand our imagination for what's possible, right? And I think that that's like um, uh, not good enough, you know, usually, right? And the other thing is the other work that, you know, that sort of happens and I, I, I can't remember who said this, but it's like, I feel like a lot of people right now are, you know, we're, we're taking, we're taking, you know, the, the moon is crashing into the earth and we're like taking a photo of it. And you're like, but look at the, I took a nice, you know, I took a nice photo of, of, of it. I, you know, I, I framed it really, you know, and, and it, again, it's also not, um, it's not really, it's not really sufficient either. Um, one thing I, I, I will say is that, I, you know, kind of going back to the earlier question about education is that I, I found that my students that I teach in, in the design department have just, a uh, um, an incredible appetite for um, and desire to do, you know, really meaningful work that they know is extremely urgent, right? And that their desire to do that work is hampered by the realities of being in debt, you know, not having guaranteed health. You know, I'm talking about the U.S. context here also, so it's a little different. But you know, everyone's in debt no matter what, but especially in the U.S., right? Um, and these factors that actually like that that can be, you know, that can be changed. Right. So I think that there, um, the uh, sort of desire, even the ability to produce these other imaginations and then, and then enact them is, is, you know, being actively hampered by these, by these financial realities that, um, that are systemic and of course, purely, completely changeable, completely optional, right? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I'd like to think a little bit more um, kind of along, the, along those lines. Um, and I'm also really interested, I'll just last thing I'll say is I'm really, really interested and curious to see all the crazy convoluted things that people decide to try to do instead of just making the simplest possible decisions of just doing, you know, of just doing less, right? Mm -hmm. Of just doing repair, you know, and it's very interesting. It's, I think it's gonna be a very interesting next, next 10 years um, of seeing just a, so many terrible ideas, and uh, and uh, you know uh, people who 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 boost those ideas and why. Thank you, Marlos. Yeah, I've just got this weird feeling that I've got like one foot in the financial system <laughs> and one foot here. I think because I'm trying to um, work in it every day and I'm trying to influence it and I feel in as part of this conversation which I've absolutely loved I've got a lot out of it but I've just makes me realize how I'm too close to it all <laughs> and I want to yeah I just yeah I'm gonna leave with that that feeling and I want to try and think about how I can be part of this sort of space a bit more so thank you I guess I going back to again the, the, the discipline I have the misfortune to inhabit in a business school is is that I, had, I gave a keynote a couple of days ago. I've been doing sust sustainable research and climate change research since the 90s, which when I was a PhD student, right? Uh, and I, I gave a keynote a couple of days ago about the future of sustainable research and business. And I said, the best thing business can do, academics, is to stop writing about sustainability. The more articles we produce about sustainability, the worse the problems get. And I can show a cause and effect because 99.9% .9 of the research on sustainability in business is about making a business case for sustainability, green finance. I'm saying that that would have been fine in the 90s. It's too late now. We've crossed that point. What you need to do now is make an ecological case for business. Why does this business need, deserve to exist? What will it take to destroy the fossil fuel industry, destroy 120, 100 half a million jobs without causing social chaos. How do we design a society where there is perpetually 50, 60% unemployment the way we measure it? You're talking about the fossil fuel industry's gross income up to trillions of dollars. I'm sure we can find a way to retrain and cushion those workers. I'd rather uh, lose my job knowing I have a cushion to retrain me than lose my job because my CEO bought his second yacht. 
So that's the kind of thinking is what kind of ecological case can we make which businesses should exist for the future of the planet. Well, thank you. Thank you all so much um, the, for your brilliant insights and provocations. And um, as we said at the beginning, obviously, the, this is this is like an endless discussion. There's so much to talk about. And um, so so we're hoping to schedule another uh, another, obviously, a final uh, a, a follow up session quite soon with Ismail. Um, but I just in the meantime, I wanted to say a big, big thank you to all of you, uh, Hannah, Marlo, Sam, and uh, uh, and Bobby and Ismail for making this happen. And uh, yeah, please, and also big thanks to our audience for their great comments and questions. And uh, please stay tuned to the Future Everything Future Focus conversations and we will be posting more. And also this discussion, uh, just to say, is available on our YouTube channel. So you can catch up and yeah, or go back and um, yeah, listen again. Thank you all so much. Have a great uh, evening or like start of the day, uh, some on the other side of the, of the Atlantic. <laughs> Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.